Hey guys, welcome to part three of my Bullet 500 restoration. So, I have an announcement before I start. If you watched my first video, you know I'm changing the bike from green to black. I wasn't going to initially, but I just couldn't find a new gas tank anywhere in this color. It's called velvet green, and I found both gloss and matte olive green, but it's just too different. I did find the fenders in the right color though. Several people have kept bugging me to keep it the original color. And it is true, if I change it to black, I'm really changing the bike. I mean, so much is already being replaced. So I took the tank to a high-end detailer in Burbank to see what they could do. And I couldn't believe what they pulled off. It's not perfect, but it looks really good. The color and gloss are back and it's got a fresh ceramic clear coat. There's still a little patina, but that just adds to the originality. I'll still replace the front and rear fenders, but they'll be in the right color, so the bike will look as it did when it was new. I'm actually really happy with this decision, and I like that I'm maintaining some originality. The place I went to is called Ceramic Pro, so if you're in the LA area and need some detailing or paint restoration, definitely hit them up. They even have some shop dogs running around as a bonus. French Bulldogs. Anyway, that's the new plan. But today, I'm opening the timing cover, replacing the oil pumps and spindle, removing the timing gears, and just getting the right side ready to drop the crankcase. I'll also show you how to lap the oil pumps so they seal perfectly within the case. And I'll install the new oil filter assembly. So I already drained the oil, so I don't think a lot's going to come out when I remove the cover. So I just put a pad down instead of pulling out the oil pan. It's kind of weird. These have flathead screws instead of something a little bit more conventional. You know, like this right here. It's kind of a weird decision, but it's fine. I don't know how tight these screws are going to be. So just to get a little bit more leverage, I'm going to use a ratchet with a flathead screwdriver on the end. So with these older Royal Enfield, sometimes the screws can be a little weird. Like that top screw might not thread well right there, and that screw might not thread well right there. So I always keep all the screws in order when I'm taking this stuff off. So as I take them off, I'm going to put them in this little cardboard thing I made just to make sure everything's in order when I put them back. So I forgot that some of these screws are different sizes, so it's definitely important to keep them in order. So that's about what I expected. Not too bad. Okay, real quick, let's just identify what we're looking at. So this is your worm gear right here. That turns the spindle that operates the oil pumps. It's connected directly to the timing pinion, and that's connected directly to the crankshaft. Then you have your two camshafts here, your exhaust and inlet side. And they operate the push rods and the valves. Then you have your two idler pinions here. Then you have your distributor pinion at the top. So the cam gear should just slide right out. Okay, this is really important. The worm gear has a left hand thread, so you actually turn it to the right to loosen it. So when you try to unscrew the worm gear, the crankshaft's just going to go up and down. So some people kind of jam a screwdriver in here to keep things from turning. I don't really like that, so I got kind of creative and sort of set up my little rig here to keep the crankshaft from turning so I can unscrew the gear.
All right, so I'm contradicting myself. I have to put a little screwdriver in here so I can get this top distributor gear off. You're a stupid dumbass. Not too bad. These next two just slide right out. All right, so there are still two gears on here. You have the timing pinion here and the distributor gear here. Both of those need an extractor to take out though. You can't just pull them out. So I'll show you how to do that next. Okay, I have a simple gear puller and we'll start with the top distributor gear and then we'll take off the smaller timing pinion. So it's just a matter of getting everything lined up. You can see the two arms with the jaws behind the gear. And then this center bolt goes right onto the bolt coming out of the gear. And then what we're going to do is we're going to tighten this and this. And then when you turn this, it's going to pull the gear out again, just like a corkscrew. and it pulls it right off. So the timing pinion is notorious. It's very difficult to get off for two reasons. First, it's on there very tight. But the main problem is the gap between the back of the gear and the case is so narrow that it's almost impossible. Let's see if I can show you there. It's almost impossible to get a puller behind it. So what I had to do is I had to grind down one of my pullers to almost a paper thin jaw just so I can get it to fit behind this gear and hopefully it doesn't snap off as I try to pull it off but uh, even Royal Enfield's official puller if you can find one is usually too thick to get behind here so you can see how thin I had to grind these down I'll put a picture up so you can see kind of a before and after and the one on the left isn't even halfway done so here's my setup. I finally got the jaws to get behind the gear. Then I put a clamp here just to make sure they're not going anywhere. And it's hopefully ready to go. Because this gear is so small, this whole rig is going to want to turn right as I start turning this knob here. So I need an extra set of hands to hold a screwdriver to keep it in place. It's actually my dad. He came over to help. Let's see what happens. So I've never taken a timing gear off of one of these bikes. I didn't really know what to expect as far as how tight it was on there. It came off fairly easily. The, the hard part was just getting jaws behind it. So if you need to take one of these off, just be prepared to modify a puller so you can get it behind it. So the last thing I need to take off on the right side is the distributor. And that's held on by three screws right here. So there's only one wire coming out of the top and it comes around and then plugs into the harness right here. So I'm just going to unplug this and bring it inside. So the right side is now clear so I can drop the crankcase. The next step is going to be taking the oil pumps and spindle out and then lapping the oil pumps so you can see how that's done. And also installing the new oil filter assembly. We're making progress. So let's get this timing cover sorted. So what we have, we have two oil pumps. We have one in there and there. And then we have a spindle. 
right here. That connects to the worm gear I took off earlier and it spins it and that's what operates the oil pumps. So I've got new oil pumps and a new spindle. So I'm going to take these out and replace them. But I also have to lap the new oil pumps. That basically means breaking them in, kind of like piston rings on a cylinder wall. And the cat's in here too. I'll also put in a new oil filter assembly. Remember the one I took out wasn't in the best of shape. Okay, sorry, I did a little bit of this off camera. It was, uh, it was a little tough getting these covers off. You know, almost 20 years with that gasket. So there and there, they were just kind of stuck on there. I had to pound them a little bit with a rubber mallet. And one of them went flying because you have a spring with like a half bearing that goes in there and then just holds the oil pump in place. You have that one and that one. So what I'm going to do now, I just got to clean all this up. It's kind of an oily mess. So here's how these mechanical oil pumps work. It's very simple. I'm going to turn the spindle. You can see just a little plunger kind of pumping in and out. And you have two pumps. You have a feeder pump and a return pump. And it's just a very simple process. Okay, everything's cleaned up and I'm ready to lap these oil pumps. And what I use to clean and degrease this, it's called gunk. And it's uh, my weapon of choice always. It's 100% safe for aluminum. And I just use it for everything. I'm going to have to clean the barrel later. came packed in oil and grease. It's kind of a mess. But they're really good stuff. So if you're looking for something to clean any engine part, get oil and grease off, gunk is definitely the way to go. So here are the oil pumps. These are the old ones. These are the new ones. You can see there's a little bit of a kind of a shiny high spot on the top and then it goes down to the left. You can kind of see it right there. So this one definitely isn't 100% even, where this one's pretty good. So these might, I might be able to preserve these. Here are the new ones. I'm not real happy with the condition of these. It looks like they've been sitting for 20 years little scratch, a little scuff. This one even has a little bit of corrosion on it. So these aren't in the best of shape. Whereas these look like they're salvageable. So especially this one. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to lap these first and see how they turn out. And if, uh, if I could get nice smooth surfaces on these, I'm just going to go with the old ones. I might use the new plungers in the old pumps. And if they don't turn out well, then I'll, I'll give these new ones a try. So We'll see how this goes. So this is a lapping tool. It's very simple. You just have that center piece that goes in the groove right there. And then that pin that just goes into one of these holes, just so you can spin this back and forth. So when you have auto saw on the other side, all you're doing is polishing the two surfaces together with this. You have this little knurled area for your fingers. And that's all there is to it. So I'm going to start with a smaller feeder pump. This one right here, the one with the little high side on the top. And we'll see how this goes. So just put a little bit of auto soil on here. The big one, the return one, you can see that uh, kind of dark band going around the circle, kind of between the outer rim and the center. So that kind of represents a low spot. So I got to keep going until that's gone, and then I'll have a perfectly flush surface. If you've ever worked with auto saw, you know it's kind of slow going. It's a fine polish, so it's good stuff, but uh, just be patient and keep working with it. You'll, you'll eventually get there. Okay, the oil pumps are now lapped, and I put a 
light coat of oil on them. They're all steel. I don't want them to rust. So these are ready to go. Now, because I was using auto saw to lap these, it's going to get into everything. It's going to get into all these little holes and everything. So it's very important that you clean all this out. So what I did was I just blasted it with WD-40 in a straw and then used the gunk on it again, washed everything out, rinsed everything with water, and just made sure I got everything out. Then used compressed air in all of the holes just to make sure everything is completely clean and there's no auto saw there. And then I baked everything in the oven for about a uh, half hour at 220. And that was just to make sure that there was absolutely no moisture anywhere and everything was 100% dry. So I'm going to end the timing cover portion here. I initially was going to just reassemble it for you guys, but then I figured I'm going to do that when I'm ready to reassemble it on the bike. And the reason for that is I'm still going to polish this timing cover. It's, uh, it's old and dull. I'm really going to clean it up. And uh, when I put this stuff back in, the oil pumps and the spindle and the oil filter assembly, I'm going to be putting a lot of oil on it. You don't want to put it in dry. And I want to keep this dry right now and clean for when I polish it. So I'll go through how all these oil pumps work and how to identify which one goes where and all of that when I reassemble the bike. So this wraps up part three. Thanks again for watching. And if you're new, definitely subscribe and stick around. In part four, we'll finish the left side of the bike, remove the primary cover, take out the clutch, alternator, and primary chain. Then we'll take off the inner case, remove the sprag clutch and starter, take off the front sprocket, so we're finally ready to drop the crankcase. And that'll be part five. Once the crankcase is out, and I replace all the bearings in the crankshaft, it's really going to represent a turning point, because then we can start reassembling the bike. So I'll see you soon, guys. So we did a DNA test, and this dog is like 50% poodle. I just don't see it. How is that even possible?